Hi, this is Caleb Kane, and you're watching King Force World History. Today on King Course AP World History, we're going to take a look at the end of Unit 8 in the Cold War and specifically go into detail on how you can use the AP writing skills of causation, comparison, and change over time to answer potential prompts about the Cold War in Unit 8. Let's go to the blackboard. Unit 8 in the Cold War lends itself very nicely to all three of the major AP uh, writing skills, including causation, compare and contrast, and change over time. And we're going to start with causation because that might be the easiest one when looking at any type of war or conflict. It has clear causes and clear effects. Now, you could get as specific with this as you wanted to. If you want to go more in depth into the events that took place within the Cold War, you could. For the sake of this uh, video, I'm going to specifically look at what caused the Cold War. So all of my events are going to take place in 1945. Now, you may remember that that's obviously the end of World War II, but there are certain events within the end of World War II that are very vital in starting the Cold War itself and the tensions, especially between the United States and the Soviet Union. The first event that does this is the Yalta Conference. At Yalta, the world powers of England, the United States, and the Soviet Union basically decided how they were going to approach the world following the events of World War II and how would we react to all of this major change that had gone on. And many of those things included what nations would be democratic, would you have free elections in certain areas of the world, or would they follow the Soviet Union's lead and become more communist and satellite nations of the Soviet Union. So a, a proximate effect of that is the spread of ideology. Whether it's democracy or communism, these things start to spread worldwide. And that debate continues specifically in Germany. And the division of Germany is a point of contention between the Soviet Union and the United States. And then another direct effect would be the Truman Doctrine. In which President Truman essentially said the United States would do whatever was necessary to not only stop the spread of communism, but to help these new independent nations. Now, long term, towards the end of the Cold War, throughout the process of the Cold War, we see several bigger effects. One of those is the U.S. policy of containment and the domino theory. Do whatever it takes to stop communism from spreading. Beat it to the punch help these young nations become democratic and liberate ones that are already communists and falling behind the communist influence of the Soviet Union. On top of that, we see the clear division of the Iron Curtain and the satellite nations of the communist bloc. And finally, we know that the United States will do whatever it can to stop the spread of communism. So that leads to a series of proxy wars including the Korean War, including Vietnam, uh, other smaller conflicts worldwide in which the U.S. gets involved in because they believe that communism is only going to continue to spread and needs to be stopped at all costs. One of the most foundational causes, however, of the tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union in the Cold War is the U.S. use of the atomic bomb. In dropping atomic bombs on both Hiroshima and Nagasaki of Japan, the United States has now established that it not only has nuclear weapons, but it's willing to use them. And that kind of puts the rest of the world on notice, especially the Soviet Union, the competing world power and the other major victor of World War II, ready for that and at odds for that. Proximately, the atomic bomb would lead most directly to the arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union and the overall use of nuclear weapons. Now, while these weapons aren't necessarily used, they are stockpiled and they are built up. And that creates this sense of Cold War and this sense of mutually assured destruction, which we discussed before. If one uses atomic bombs, the other country will as well, and they will destroy each other. So long term, this creates a sentiment of fear worldwide. It also creates more competition between our so-called world powers. And it also establishes the United States as a world power or as the world power. Once you use the bomb, you can't really go back from that. And the United States has now elevated itself through a position of power to a place it's never been before. 
Our final cause within the Cold War is the formation of the United Nations. Now, the United Nations does not necessarily directly contribute to the fact that we have the Cold War, but it is instrumental in how this war results and how it's finished. And the United Nations was meant to set up this framework for peace as well as a protection of human rights that we've never seen before. So the United Nations most proximately affects the Cold War by causing peacekeeping. And these peacekeeping missions, you may remember that Korea and the Korean War began as a United Nations peacekeeping mission. We have other examples of this, including uh, the example of the Suez Canal and some of the conflict between Egypt and Israel. And throughout the Middle East, there's been different times where the UN has gotten involved. Because of that, there's now a framework for how to resolve conflict that we didn't have before World War II. And hopefully, there's now a de-escalation of military tensions worldwide because of the UN. Now, long term, the United Nations has done two things. It has better connected the world in a way it hasn't been before. We call that globalization. The world's starting to interact and work together in a very cohesive manner that it hasn't had before. Membership in the UN allows protection and it allows diplomacy and also allows trade. That's a great opportunity for these new growing nations. And on top of that, the United Nations also produced a document called the Declaration of Human Rights, which outlined everything that every single human has given to them, whether by God or whatever the individual's worldview is that those rights should be protected and more importantly, not violated by anybody. So the protection of human rights is truly something we probably take for granted because we've all lived in a world that has that, but that has not always been the case. And it allows for greater freedom and greater safety worldwide, showing that Yes, the UN definitely has an effect on the world, not just in the Cold War, but for years to come. So there you have three different causes from the Cold War that are very uh, specific in how the Cold War started, but also, as you can see in the effects, have specific effects within the Cold War and specific effects long-term that stem from the Cold War. When using the AP skill of comparison in Unit 8, it makes the most sense to compare the two superpowers of the time, the United States and the Soviet Union. We will specifically look at how both these superpowers tried to assert their influence throughout the world and promote their ideology. So we'll start with the United States. Generally, the United States is a little bit more peaceful in that the United States specifically supports the UN. And acts as a mediator or a peacekeeper in different parts of the world. A great example of that, again, would be the Korean War or things like the Suez Crisis where the U.S. is kind of involved but not necessarily totally involved, but really working for the promotion of peace in that area. On the other hand, the United States has also, in many instances, directly provided aid, whether it's the Berlin Airlift where they dropped in supplies and food into East Germany and East Berlin or in the Yom Kippur War. When President Nixon authorized one of the largest military airdrops of military weapons and supplies into Israel to allow them to defend themselves from Egypt in that war, the U.S. has often done that to promote and protect its allies. And finally, uh, the United States also does some undercover work with the CIA and coups. Remember, these dirty tricks boys often find ways to promote leaders who would be more likely to embrace democracy and help the United States out in the future, especially when it came to regions that had resources like oil that the United States had in high demand. On the other hand, the Soviet Union is often a little bit more in the face of the individuals that they want to convert to communism, if you will. Uh, examples of this include the numerous invasions that the Soviet Union undertakes. Uh, specifically think about Afghanistan, as well as some of the Eastern Europe invasions as well. The Soviet Union loves to get involved in these different areas and really assert their will on top of these countries that they want to be communist. On the other hand, the, the Soviet Union will also engage in revolutions, supporting revolutionaries who uphold communist ideas like Castro in Cuba 
or Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam. And the other major difference that the Soviet Union has from the United States is that the Soviet Union has a major communist ally, and that is China. And the two of them together attempt to bring communism throughout the world, China and Asia, the Soviet Union more so in Eastern Europe and the Middle East. But together they kind of create this superpower that makes communism a little more worldwide. However, being superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union do use similar tactics to spread their ideologies and influences. One of the best examples of that is the alliances that both have. For the U.S., it's NATO. For the Soviet Union, it's the Warsaw Pact. Both of which were created to sort of stop the other and check the other. Both of them are also very involved in both the arms... And the space race, the clear competition between the two shows that they're really after the same thing. And a lot of that is military and political dominance worldwide. And maybe the final one would be uh, proxy wars and the fact that both of these countries will get involved in numerous wars, whether it's through supplying or literally fighting in areas where communism or democracy are hotly contested. And overall, we see that both of these superpowers are very similar in the way they go about them, but the actual instances are a little bit different and more specific. So hopefully you could use that potentially if you're asked a comparison question on an LEG. Finally, the Cold War and the time after World War II is certainly a time where we have very intense change worldwide, but there's also some things that stay the same. So we want to identify those in three categories, political, cultural, and then economic or social. We'll kind of lump those together. Let's start with political. Probably the biggest change that we have uh, worldwide remains the introduction of new states. And we would call that a part of decolonization. So think about places like Israel, India, Ghana, the list goes on. There's many throughout the world, but the continuity is that whenever these new states pop up and in existing states as well, they are either democratic or communist. We have a domination of these two uh, political structures and governmental ideas worldwide. When it comes to culture, there's a lot of change going on, especially in the way in which we view the world and we view ourselves. And a lot of that is often tied to not only worldviews, but religion. And one of those changes is certainly the rise of secularism. Social Darwinism, natural selection, all of that is becoming more and more popular. And in general, people are beginning to move away from basic uh, religious beliefs, whether that's in a different part of the world or here in the United States with Christianity. For the most part, people are becoming less religious. However, the continuity is that the people that are remaining religious are continuing to believe the same things they always have. We call that fundamentalism. And that's true for Christians in the United States. It's also very true for many Muslim movements uh, in the Middle East. Think specifically about Iran and the changes that took place there within the Iranian Revolution. A lot of that was to get back to the original beliefs of the Muslim faith. So overall, that's really a continuity because those religions continue to believe what they believe. And then finally, for economic or social, I'm going to focus more on the social side of things. And one of those examples of changes is the use of terrorism. This is now happening worldwide. We talked about many different examples of this, including the events of the 1972 Munich Olympic bombings. You have other examples worldwide, uh, like with the PLO and the airline hijackings in which individuals are trying to be heard and do so using force and making a statement that's often seen worldwide thanks to the media. That's definitely a change. But the continuity from this union is that the world is only going to get more and more connected. So that word we've thrown around before called globalization is a continuity for the past two centuries. Ever since um, the turn of the century with the Industrial Revolution and then the events of World War I, the world has only gotten more connected. And by now, we can consider this to be a continuity because that's not changing anytime soon. That's only going to increase and continue to stay the same. So with all that considered, the world has changed very dramatically within the time of the Industrial Revolution, within the time of World War I, within the time of World War II, and then, of course, within the time 
of the Cold War, and yet there are things that still remain the same. And that's really what history shows us, that there's always going to be change, and yet some things never change. Thanks for watching.